Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the international high-level event Media and Information Literate Citizens hosted by UNESCO. This is the third thematic webinar out of four and it has the title MIL as a backbone for intercultural dialogue and anti-hate speech. Our aim today is to discuss uh, this topic against the background that um, how the UNESCO uh, MIL curriculum has been adapted to national context. Um, the discussion is related to the new online resource, Media and Information Literate Citizens Think Critically, Click Wisely, MIL Curriculum for Educators and Learners. It has now been released and features an updated, revised version of the model curriculum launched back in 2011. Very pioneering work. Within um, the past decade or so, one of the issues that has significantly increased is hate speech. Uh, it's related to um, the extension of the digital public sphere and uh, the possibilities of citizens to express themselves. In this thematic webinar, we will address the policies, pedagogies and practices of MIL to ask if and how MIL could work as an anti-hate hate speech tool, uh, cultivating intercultural dialogue. My name is Marit Jakkola. Uh, I'm co-director of Nordicom, uh, that is a center for Nordic media research in Sweden. So greetings from the Nordic countries. But today uh, we have a great panel of distinguished media literacy experts uh, from different continents, different countries, uh, to discuss uh, hate speech in a global and global context. National states and regions have their own approaches uh, and traditions to deal with MIL and accordingly hate speech. So it's kind of interesting to know how this, uh, the, the challenges uh, and the problems and also, also the opportunities look uh, in different parts of the world. Please feel free to leave any questions on, or comments uh, in the Q&A box below. Um, if you have a question, please be specific uh, about who of, your, of our panelists you are addressing. So, let me introduce our panel members today. We'd like to know more about their background and their personal relationship uh, to media and information literacy, which is a very diverse uh, and versatile field. First, we have Professor Paul R. Carr, Carr from Canada. Paul is a full professor in the Department of Education at the U University du Québec uh, on Outaouais. He's also the UNESCO Chair in Democracy, Global Citizenship and Transformative Education. His research focuses on political sociology with, uh, with specific threats related to global citizenship, peace studies, intercultural relations and transformative change in education. Currently, he runs two interesting research projects funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And uh, these give us some relevant keywords in Professor Carr's work. Um, the first one is called Democracy, Political Literacy and Transformative Education. And the second one, Social Media, Citizen Partipa Participation and Education. Uh, he has written and co-edited 17 books altogether, for example, on critical pedagogy and democracy. And his newest book, uh, written with Gina Thesse, has an interesting title. It's not education that scares me, it's the educators. Is there still hope for democracy in education and education for democracy? Before entering academia, um, Professor Kaur uh, was a senior policy advisor in the Ontario Ministry of Education in Canada, working on equity and social justice issues. So you are very welcome, Paul. And uh, I'd like to ask you, what are the most valuable insights you have gained uh, through your research work uh, with MIL and transformative education? Or actually, I'd like to pose you the question, and that is in your book title. What is the thing exactly that scares you in the current educators? Is there still hope for democracy in education and education for democracy? Thank you, Merit. Wonderful to be here. Wonderful to be with everyone. Um, I think with uh, the research that we've been 
undertaking for the last few years. We're very interested in social media at a few different levels. One is the, the consumption of media. We are all affected and infected by social media, even when we don't use it. Uh, TikTok, Snapchat, there's so many uh, uh, out there that even when we don't use them, we're, we're aware of, of memes, ideas, uh, concepts. So the consumption is, is so vast and it's overtaken traditional media in many regards, although traditional media lays into these platforms. And it's the production of media. We all interact to some level. We comment, we share, we produce videos, we engage at different levels. And the third and most important part for our research is the engagement. How do people engage with social media? How does it affect them? And what we're interested to know is what is the effect, the influence of social media on people's citizen participation in relation to social justice uh, and other types of engagement? So social media is so ubiquitous and it has such a wide influence, but there's many different sides of the equation. On the one hand, it's very democratic. We're all out there. There's many social media movements. Me Too, Black Lives Matter, I Don't Know More, uh, Arab Spring, and we can go on. These all have resulted in large part, I think, because of social media. And at the same time, we have a lot of other uh, contrary uh, tendencies in relation to hate uh, speech and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of areas to tease out. In relation to the book title, it's not a personal problem. We like educators and we like people. But we've set up these systems where neoliberalism seems to be the one and only choice. We seem to evaluate people on things that we already know that <laughs> kids in better off neighborhoods and so on with better off schools seem to perform better and so on. Um, and we're very concerned about the potential for formal education to stimulate bona fide, uh, meaningful, uh, transformative democracy. And so, uh, uh, th these are concerns for us in relation to media and information literacy. We're concerned about political literacy. Uh, hate speech hasn't arisen because of social media. It's an extension of what's happening in society. And why is there so much hate in society? So on the one hand, it's good. It's out there. We know it. We see it. We can, we can document it. Uh, but on the other hand, why is there so much uh, vilification? And in particular, one of the areas that we've been looking at is white power and privilege, uh, whiteness. Uh, what is it about uh, white people in general? And I don't mean to vilify white people, but why such a a robust, uh, cantankerous uh, onslaught. And we see this now mobilizing in political regimes uh, in North America and Europe. And often I think the most insidious forms are not the frontal forms, but more subtle uh, kind of um, uh, placing into question immigration, uh, other, other forms uh, of inequity. Um, and so we've now created these words like cancel culture and so on, um, political correctness. It was all there before. Uh, it's a way of uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, the, the, these social movements resonate with many people, but our political systems are very um, dichotomized. And I guess just to end in relation to the work in our UNESCO chair, we're very concerned about <laughs> democracy. We have what we call normative, representative, hegemonic democracy, but fewer and fewer people are participating in these elections and the institutions are, are very much questioned. So in a way, what's happening in social media is a representation of how many people wish to mobilize. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the hate uh, dimension, but it is everywhere. And when we think of racism, uh, we're not in a post-racial society. We're in a highly uh, prolifically racial uh, world, sadly. So that's uh, my introduction, but uh, looking forward to the comments from everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. And you mentioned many phenomena in the social web that are very relevant and also uh, call for the, the update we have in the mill curriculum now. So thank you. Uh, we'll discuss these things later. But as the second panelist, we have Professor Milena Dragicevic Šešić from Serbia. Uh, she's a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of Arts in Belgrade. She's also the UNESCO Chair in Cultural Policy and Management.
And she studied as a lecturer at the Faculty of Dramatic Arts in Belgrade, Belgrade in 1978. And for decades now, she has been dealing with media ethics, researching the impact of media, hate, hate speech and populist political communication in social, political and, and cultural life. She has also been engaged as an activist and in activist contexts and created numerous training courses for teachers, museum and, and library workers and cultural activists. You are very welcome, Professor Cecic. As a cultural scholar, your focus has very much been on the challenges in the Balkans regarding possibilities and obstacles for, for intercultural dialogue, which is the topic of today. Initially, you were brought to issues of media literacy when the so-called media war started in socialist Yugoslavia. Could you tell more about your background, what brought to the media literacy issues in, in, in your region? In fact, you are very right. Uh, being brought in a multicultural state, in multicultural environment, you are used to have these two different discourses, one official one, very politically correct and so on, and one which is a little bit hidden, but sometimes unfortunately, was seen as a space of freedom when you criticize the other and speak about repression as the only our ethnic group. Even our mind was majoritarian, but still these voices of like we are repressed, uh, everybody else is supported and so on. But then, when after Tito's death in the 1980s, media freedom started to be gained, unfortunately. And that what turned me from cultural studies more to media studies, we saw instead of democratization of media, immediately this freedom was misused for raising the ethnic hatred, different sorts of manipulation, taking uh, uh, elements from history, but in different moments of history, always one ethnic group was repressed and the other was, I'm speaking from medieval ages till today. So, but every ethnic groups through media created felons, created like we are going to discover for you how we have been exploited, tortured and so on. Thus, I joined the, the activist groups immediately at the beginning of 90s and we did a lot of research on media war and hatred. That's how we call it in that time. That was exactly before military war started. The uh, all media in the country has been really involved, like they say, in investigative journalism, but in fact, it was not that. It was hatred speech. But uh, uh, through Radio B92, which was the activist radio, we created also media forms to fight against uh, those uh, manipulative uh, discourses in media against those vocabulary. So different sort of jingles that uh, acted as a tool, as a reminder, as a just to raise awareness that things are not exactly as they are presented in our press. From Slovenia to Macedonia, we cannot really say except in every of these countries, few free media, but with a very small tirage, with a very small outreach. Mostly it was local radio stations, not TV stations in that time, that fight it against uh, this hatred speech. And hatred speech was really uh, used on a level to provoke the other to offend the other, to deliberately use the words that you know that they are going to hurt the other community. Shiptar for Albanian, uh, Tsiganin for Roma, etc., etc. And we can, uh, or in Croatia, uh, the word gypsy, Tsiganin was used for Serbs to offend them and so on. So every nation had, or for Slovenes, uh, there was invented a term, uh, Austrian servants or something like that. So, but this 
the problem was that it was not only on social networks. That was even before social networks. So we cannot accuse social networks for everything. It was even in public media, in official media. In spite of the fact, I found it very nice that Professor Paul Carr is from Canada because our media studies completely were developed from works of Howard Innes, Marshall McLuhan, Roland Lorimer, and many Canadians that develop. So we had theories, we had researchers, we had investigative journalism and so on. But unfortunately, throughout the Balkan space, and this is still present in uh, most commercial, most tabloid, most read, and most... Uh, watched or listened media, this hatred speech seems to be raising the tirage, the number of copies, raising the interest, because it's appealing on people's emotions. It's appealing to the sense of justice, because everyone is persuaded that only his group. It can be also, uh, for example, I've heard a lot of hatred speech by majoritarian people, heterosexuals, against the uh, LGBT community, like they're privileged. Europe is stimulating. All the money is going to their associations and so on. And then it's expressed with, without any, of course, data and so on, expressed with a, such wording for this community. It's same a misogyny, a hatred, uh, hatred speech toward women is uh, so widespread that sometimes those that are using certain examples, sentences, and so on, are not even aware. Of course, now I'm speaking about all negative elements, but there are a lot of strong forces in society from, uh, let's say, universities, academic sphere to civil society that are uh, fighting against hatred speech, that are finding new instruments of intercultural di dialogue and mediation to be not only instructive, but to show other possibilities of public communication. And But I assume later on, we are going to have more time to discuss about uh, positive examples. Definitely. Thank you, Professor uh, Milana Drati. Uh, um, about this historical perspective, there are a lot of lessons learned to be taken to um, the current um, conditions and uh, to address uh, the power of discourse. So thank you. Then from Europe to Africa, our third panelist is Dr. Olunifesi Surai from Nigeria. Uh, he's a senior, senior lecturer in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of Lagos. Uh, he's also the national coordinator um, of the UNESCO-initiated Universities Network on Media and Information Literacy uh, and member of UNESCO Global Experts on Education for Countering et Extremism. And he has also been in a number of other UNESCO uh, engaged in a number of uh, an, uh, UNESCO um, related tasks. He holds a doctoral degree in information science from University of Ibadan and a postgraduate degree in mass communication from the University of Lagos. And uh, his publications and areas of research interest uh, uh, include um, media and information literacy and an intercultural dialogue, social media and journalists. Uh, safety of journalists and freedom of expression, so very relevant for today. Dr. Shuras is the executive director of African Center for Media and Intercultural Dialogue. Um, so welcome, uh, Dr. Shuras. And the same question to you. What made you interested in MIL and uh, especially what kind of topics are relevant uh, in your country right now? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's nice uh, being here. And I must say that uh, I got interested in me because I feel that 
is the way to empower the citizens. And like I always say, we have come to a society where uh, the shrinking, the society is shrinking to digital space, to online space. And so there's less interaction. There's less, and we are coming to a situation where cultures are amalgamating together in a particular civil space. And so people come from different culture, different background, different race, and they need to understand each other. They, they need to engage, they need to interact. And so what I've been stressing all this year is that media and information literacy without intercultural dialogue does not actually have any meaning because we must dialogue. We must dialogue stereotype. We must dialogue, uh, you know, we must recognize differences, that people have differences. We must accept that differences. We must live with that differences. We must have that tolerate, that we must tolerate people and based on their differences. We must have that intercultural sensitivity. We must be sensitive to culture and we must engage people based on their culture. And I think this is where the conflict comes. Conflict comes when media stereotype people, conflict comes when people don't want to recognize people's differences. Conflict comes, and this is where the hate speech comes. So when you look at the issue of propaganda, propaganda, all kinds of stuff, they come from people who have political intention and they foster this intention on people. So uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of way, I would say that there are three ways I'm looking at intercultural dialogue when it comes to media and information literacy. One, can we make free speech without going to hate speech? Is it possible? How can citizens express themselves, freedom of expression, without actually go making an hate speech? Thirdly, is there any way that government can come up with a policy to regulate a speech without bringing culture of silence, that is, without being about self-censorship on, on the part of the citizens? Is there any way that citizens can express themselves and the people can dialogue in such a way that they understand what uh, anybody is saying? Then the fourth one that I'm really interested in is that can we use the same social media? Because social media, like, some, like uh, Paul Carl said, Social media uh, has been the echo chamber that promotes a speech. A speech has always been there. If you go back to the First World War, the Second World War, a speech play a very prominent role. And like uh, Miliana said just now, a speech, you find a speech in other public media, it's always been there. But now, you have a digital medium that aggregates all this speech and bring it to focus, bring the narrative to focus and the extremist content. Now, the question is, now that we have come to live in this space called social media, is there any way we can use social media? We can bring about credible messengers, people who understood hate speech, who can analyze hate speech, who can see beyond the motives of those who are propagating hate speech, and who can be able to dissect hate speech and be able to counter it in such a way that they make the speech, you know, a uh, kind of does not have the effect that those who are behind it want to make. And I think this is where the problem is. The speech will not leave. Now the truth about it, a speech will continue as far as well, social media, a speech will continue as well, people who are racist, a speech will continue as far well, as well, people who are who want to, you know, uh, put up their own narratives. But the issue is this people must be media literate. People must engage and they must understand a speech so it does not affect them negatively. I think that is where the whole, the whole issue is. And I've done a lot of work on this. I've written paper on using social media for de-radicalization or de-extremism. I've also written paper on intercultural dialogue in the multi-class environment. That is just like Nigeria that have diverse culture, diverse religion, Diverse political narratives. So, in a classroom, how can we start training these children so we produce graduates who are global, who are the orientation of the global citizens who can engage not only with their own tribes, with their own ethnic, but with everybody around the world. I think this is where uh, you know we are actually very, very down to. Thank you, Dr. Olu Nesi Zuraj. Um, uh, for adding a new perspective. Finally, to our fourth speaker, who is Bayan Tal. Um, Mrs. Tal is a media literacy specialist with more than 40 years of experience uh, from Jordan. Uh, 
Most of her career uh, has been focused on supporting and empowering a new generation of young journalists and students with the skills they need to advance their careers and support their rights and freedoms. And she has pe spent the last five years at Jordan Media Institute, where she has led the design and implementation of donor funded project re projects related to media communication and mill. She has also been active in, in policy work. She has designed and led the first mill project in jo Jordan in 2016 and assisted in drafting the national strategy for mill in Jordan. So welcome, Mrs. Tal. And what's your personal relationship to mill? Thank you so much. I'm so honored and grateful to UNESCO for this opportunity to be among these amazing, uh, distinguished scholars. Um, I started uh, um, my uh, obsession with media and information literacy in 2016, when I, a year after I joined the, the Jordan Media Institute, um, because we felt it is a much needed uh, for Jordan uh, on many fronts. Um, first of all, on the fact that we needed people to appreciate good journalism because we're a journalism academic institute. Uh, and uh, we could see that the media in Jordan and generally in the Arab world, because we also have students from the Arab world, was in a very bad shape. Uh, it's, um, uh, there's a lot, it is polarized, it is uh, mainly owned by uh, governments, uh, uh, there's not a lot of freedom. Uh, for for journalists to work uh, and do their job properly and not a lot of freedom for people to express themselves. So uh, for us, media and information literacy is a tool for people and because there is a, um, a, a mushrooming of uh, 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 social media platforms uh, in our part of the world, it was important for people to be able to not just consume but produce media uh, and be active and wise uh, uh, users and consumers of media. Uh, and all these skills are under the media and information literacy. So it just so happened that UNESCO had issued a call for proposals that was funded by the European Union. And so we, I applied, I drafted the proposal and I applied and we got the, the project. And so we, it, the idea was to, to basically just um, advocate media and information literacy, but we went far beyond that. Uh, we drafted a white paper on, uh, on uh, MIL for Jordan, uh, and we uh, analyzed the curriculum of uh, two universities in Jordan. And we worked with these two universities and we did a pilot project with four schools, uh, actually eight schools, four girls and four boys schools. Um, this was, uh, and we trained the teachers in these schools who went back to their schools and uh, started media literacy uh, uh, clubs uh, for students who wanted to, uh, uh, to volunteer. It was not part of the school system. It, the classes uh, took place either before school or after school. Uh, and the, because the, the project was so successful, uh, the Minister of Education at the time came and visited the students and he talked to the girls and he was so impressed with what they were saying about the skills they acquired and how they were able to even uh, help their, their parents uh, who were arguing over uh, a picture on, on WhatsApp, which is, it is very popular, especially with parents. Uh, uh, and uh, so they were able to tell them how to check that image and uh, the story behind it and all that. So they became very, um, uh, uh, very confident of the way they were using media and they transferred not just to their parents, but to their peers as well. We were lucky enough for that minister of education to become the prime minister. So when he did, it was very, uh, uh, it was a, an opportunity for us to just uh, um, uh, go ahead and uh, draft a strategy for Jordan where we can include it and integrate it into all sectors. And, and it was adopted as a priority by, by the government in 2019. Uh, the, 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 uh, the idea is for uh, MIL to be integrated into schools, universities, um, youth centers, 
and the uh, um, the uh, me, uh, civil society organizations and the media. So it's four components. Um, we've been very uh, successful in acquiring and getting funding for all these components and have been working diligently since then uh, to, uh, to integrate it. We have integrated MIL into three classes in Jordan, grades eight, nine and uh, sorry grade seven eight and ten and now we're working on curriculum for the rest of the uh, grades um we are we've trained hundreds of of teachers uh the ministry of education is on board and we're very lucky uh, to be leading the the region in uh integrating mil on such a large and national scale so um uh, to to bring it back to hate speech and uh, and uh, press freedoms, I think it's important that uh, because of the exercises that we use, the examples that we use, we raise awareness on hate speech. We use examples from our own culture, from our own society, um, and uh, we uh, we use role playing. I think it's it, it's very helpful. It's very uh, constructive, and they become aware of the impact of hate speech or bullying on the recipient. And uh, uh, because we have also a, a media credibility monitor in Jordan called Akid, they also do reports on um, uh, violations by media organizations and journalists. Uh, and we call them out when they do that. And so it's important to maintain the quality of journalism and uh, for people to appreciate good journalism. I think we can work from the bottom up and have a generation that appreciates good journalism and pushes for freedoms uh, because we, you know, we're constantly um, um, uh, on the lower scale of press freedoms. I think it's important for generations to appreciate the, these freedoms and, the, uh, and appreciate good journalism. And we can do that through MIL, definitely. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Bayantal. This is very timely because um, press freedom plays a central role uh, when we talk about hate speech into cultural dialogue, it has the institutional side. And next week, uh, on the 3rd of May, uh, is the World Press Freedom Day. And um, World Press Freedom Day has its origins in a UNESCO conference uh, in Windhoek in 1991. And today is the day to start the celebrations uh, with a conference hosted by UNESCO. And this year's theme is uh, quite appropriately, as you said, information as public good. And this specifically highlights the mill capacities that enable people to recognize journalism as a vital part of information and as a public good. Um, I guess uh, if we talk about, before going to, to the specific question of hate speech, if we talk about uh, the institutional conditions uh, for, for freedom of expression, and uh, which is increasingly challenged, um, Different countries have very different conditions for developing mill. Uh, for example, in the Press Freedom in Index, uh, Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Denmark, the Nordic countries um, rank the or hold the top position. Canada uh, ranks uh, as the 14th, uh, Serbia uh, 93rd, Nigeria holds the rank of 120, and Jordan 129. So um, you have many of you have have been engaged in capacity capacity building for journalists and journalists are also encountering hate speech so what do you think what should be done to improve the conditions of freedom of ex ex expression do you have any examples from your countries maybe in journalists training or in in developing a specific uh, type of news literacy to increase the transparency of journalism and also the, the understandings of the, the audience towards what journalism is. Maybe we could uh, start by, yeah, if you want to, to answer this question, because Jordan uh, was not at the top of the list uh, uh, by Antal. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah. It's very tough. It's very tough. Um, the thing is, it's. Um, I think it's. It's three things. Um, we need a good education, good journalism education. 
uh, because the way things are, uh, education, journalism education is is way uh, below what is required, way below the market, way below what is needed out there, uh, does not represent what's happening in newsrooms across uh, media organizations. So we need to reform and uh, 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 we basically need a white revolution in, in journalism education. We need partnerships. It's very important to support civil society organizations in our part of the world who are doing the good work, uh, who are trying to push for freedoms, to push for these uh, um, uh, um, uh, skills for, for, for the public. We need to support independent media organizations who are also doing excellent work in Jordan, but are also facing the challenges of, uh, you know, um, restrictions and funding, because it's very difficult now to create the business model that will give them, you know, they can continue the income where they can continue to do the work. Journalism is expensive work, and it's very important that they get the support they need. And we also need, finally, the political will. If the political will is not there, no matter what we do, it's always uh, uh, an uphill struggle. Uh, well, uh, maybe uh, since two of us are guilty, I mean, uh, two of us are guilty, uh, Nigeria and uh, Jordan, <laughs> so maybe two of us should now speak. <laughs> Actually, uh, she spoke very well from Jordan side. From the Nigerian side, uh, you must give uh, a kind of uh, credit to the activists, the NGO, the civil organizations in Nigeria. For instance, uh, like he surely mentioned about political will. We don't have political will in Nigeria. I must confess that because we have uh, people in leadership who are promoting a speech bill and social media bill, anti-social media bill. And when you look at the content of a speech bill, uh, it's ambiguous what the definition of a speech actually is. When you speak against government, it's considered as a speech. Government use regulatory bodies to sanction media houses for expressing what you consider as a normal free speech. That's why I said that we need to differentiate between a speech and free speech. So, but the NGO go to the occasion, they fought government to drop the a speech bill because they felt that those, uh, that bill was not in the interest of the masses. It's to protect governance and the individuals who are, who are using that law to clamp down on freedom of expression, to clamp down on online narratives, to clamp down and to create a kind of uh, culture of silence. And, that is, and so the, the social, the, uh, the NGOs in Nigeria, social organization, and we also am part of them, activists, I appear on TV several times and condemn the bill and rose against it. Now, we're able to shut down a speech bill. Now, also social media bill, that is to monitor social media, to contain it, was also shut down. So you see that, I think if you use the index very well, Nigeria, civil organizations, the NGOs have been foremost in defending freedom of expression. And so far, they've been able to uh, achieve it. And I must mention an organization called Setup. Setup has been taking government to courts and saying that you don't have the right to do this. You don't have the right to contest speech. So uh, well, in part of this world, uh, Nigeria uh, well, will be down because of we don't have political will. But I must tell you that the citizens are aware of their rights. There is increasing awareness to freedom of expression. And when you look at narratives right now in Nigeria, you see the so-called anti sars and you see what's something also coming up right now, where the online, the online social media are coming out with uh, information that go, that will not see in the public purview, that the government wants to silence it. So uh, one way or the other, uh, I think the missing link, the negative, is the political will. But I will tell you that in terms of rights, Citizen rights, freedom of expression, pushing for those narratives. The Nigerian government, uh, the Nigerian civil organizations, the NGOs, uh, the academics have been on the forefront to fight. And so, and we're not relenting. Many journalists have been jailed, but yet we are campaigning against it. And so, the civil organizations here are very, very active in defending freedom of expression. Yes, thank you. Um, but yeah, you're talking about hate speech, and we should be talking about hate speech. But according to the United Nations, there's no 
internationally shared or legal definition of what actually is hate speech. And the characterization of what is hateful is also very controversial, disputed. Uh, we tend to have many descriptions, terms to capture hate speech. We talk about intolerance, negative stereotyping, exclusion, discrimination. You have also mentioned many terms to denote this phenomenon. How would you define hate speech and how should it be detect detected? What about uh, Professor Milana Cesic? I think that uh, hate speech can exactly be defined as deliberate intention by message and discourse to offend, humiliate, ironize the other. And to put it in a very, uh, how to say, uh, position that the <laughs> other do not have neither access to media to defend itself, neither or even if succeed somehow to appear on some media, it's going to be again 10 times more uh, paid back uh, this kind of public humiliation, ironizing and so on. And I would like to underline what Surai was saying about importance of civil society in fighting for the, uh, let's say, culture of speech, dialogue and tolerance. And the problem, of course, you mentioned that, is political will. In fact, I have to say that we have good journalists, that we have excellent education for journalists. I personally was, by pure chance now, and first time telling that openly, I was 15 years ago or something uh, in the accreditation jury for accrediting the colleges for journalism and so on. It's a very high level of education, Tra included training, practice and so on. But it's not journalists that are introducing hatred speech in the public. It's unfortunately our politician. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's even our ministries. And mm -hmm. then you have those people might consider them journalists, but the uh, how I'd say top rank of editors in public media or in uh, commercial media, they take over entertaining function, taking exactly those elements of hatred speech and then betting on it, continuing on it, furthering that and so on. So it's a, it's a very interesting phenomena that what we need we need courses for politicians, not for journalists against hate point. speech. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, we have another issue which is very dangerous. There are courses for young politicians held mostly by world-renowned marketing agencies. And those courses are only how to raise popularity nothing else, how to raise popularity among public opinion. And now they're getting lessons for really highly competent marketing uh, advisors. There is uh, marketing for political parties in Serbia are led by foreign companies. So uh, we have excellent marketing agencies, but our one are very aware of the impact of hatred speech. Foreign, they don't care. They are paid to make the most popularity they can. So what I would like to say is that we, uh, that's the reason why we are unfortunately on 93rd place. Uh, we don't have uh, 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 media with the national frequencies that are free, their commercial media. That's something, for example, that's interesting to say that Council of Europe and European Union didn't get. Why intellectuals in Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia were against privatization of local media? For us, it was clear that it's not going to detach 
media from local authorities and control, or contrary, private owner now of this media is not interesting in any public good, public value. He's interesting only in having good links with local or national politicians for his business purposes. So now commercial media are more controlled, more propagating hatred speech and banal propaganda than public media. And that's the paradox of democratization. And that's something that we lost quality on local media, for example, exactly intercultural dialogue and so on. Uh, independent cultural scene of Serbia, civil society organization, is every year making analysis to whom is given public money on the public call competitions, both for media and for cultural organizations. In both cases, you see that the public money is given for tabloid media, for really kind of uh, not for the real investigative journalism or for experimental artistic work on the other side. Only foreign money might come to help projects of intercultural dialogue, for example, theater performances, which incorporate Albanian and Serbian actors together, which deal with Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian disputes, memory conflicts, you know, this differencing perceptions and so on. But public money in any of those Balkan countries is not going to support projects, artistic projects of intercultural dialogue or media investigative journalism that will endorse intercultural dialogue. Thank you, Professor Milan. Uh, how about Professor Carr? Uh, do you have any alternative definitions of, of uh, hate speech? This was a very extensive and, and good one. Uh, or how do you see what kind of so social so, 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 societal development caters to hate speech? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Milena. A very comprehensive and uh, interesting discussion. I think that uh, hate speech is uh, it, 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 it has many forms and uh, I, I would like to just step back a second and I think the, the field, the profession of journalism, I'm not going to say it's on its knees, but it has been significantly diminished and I think uh, the control of uh, mass media, political organizations, and this is why there's a flourishing of uh, alternative uh, independent media outlets, citizen journalists, activists around the world, um, th there just isn't a lot of hope in kind of formal journalism. I'm not saying that they're not good people doing good work like educators in schools, but the framework. And I think, you know, as Chomsky has said, you can say whatever you want as long as it's within the, these two little goal lines. And just as an example, uh, uh, for example, in the United States, there are 20 soldiers or veterans who commit suicide every day. And in 2020, in the midst of this global pandemic, it was the world's greatest spending spree on military armaments. Now, these stories are not really revealed. They're not really critiqued. They're not really uh, taken up. And we could talk about many other stories of uh, minority groups that are vilified and uh, anti-homophobic uh, you know, and Islamophobic and anti-immigrant. Um, so I think that it really speaks to a broader context. And what Melinda was saying, I think, in a way relates to some of the work we've been doing, is that normative democracy is not about democracy. It's the word democracy, but it's about winning. It's a horse race. And how you can win is by polarizing people, vilifying people, uh, eliminating people. And this is a tendency now all over the place. And we've replaced the notion of bona fide, meaningful, transformative democracy with this notion of two parties and who gets elected. And then you have all of the political will. So in a way, I'm not very hopeful of giving training sessions to politicians. I think that the, the system has to be reformed. We have to think of other ways through education, through social uh, uh, solidarity to really in, invigorate uh, public debate uh, deliberative democracy, where people can discuss without killing one another. In relation to hate speech, for example, in Canada over the last several years, there's been some excellent work on radicalization. 
And how do people get radicalized? Why are they so disaffected? And my own feeling is that people have, many people have always been disaffected in gangs and, you know, for genocides and others. So it's not just those select people that wish to go to certain countries to fight uh, against uh, other, other countries. But the question I have is, what is it in our societies? Why are so many people so apt to accept and engage with these messages? On the one hand, many people would say, when you're born, you're not born racist, sexist, full of hate. So where, where do you learn this? Is it culture? Is it education? Is it uh, political systems? I think people have to be somewhat uh, vulnerable to these messages. I'm sure that everyone on this panel, I could give you every hateful message I have. I'm not sure if you're going to join a hate movement along with me. To there, There's many other conditions and a lot of disaffection. And when we noticed in the United States in particular, with the, it was quite brutal on January 6th with this insurrection. Why so many people, tens of millions of people that support uh, concepts, if we were to throw out some of the, the concepts that the, the, they believe in, um, a lot of people would find that repugnant. But th this is a a, almost a majority of people. And in many other societies, there are white supremacist hate groups in Scandinavia, in France, in Britain, in Canada, around the world. Now, why? Why are they there? The social media gives them resonance, gives them a platform, but it's not the social media that created these, uh, these hate groups. What can we do about it? I think we have to really rethink our, our political systems. Uh, this, you know, winner gets all, one candidate wins everything is probably not very helpful. Education has to take up media literacy in different ways. And there are some very, very good work. My colleague, Michael Hoaxman and others are doing excellent work, media literacy. But I think we have to think, uh, Paulo Freire, who's inspired our work, spoke about reading the world beyond reading the word. And I think often in media literacy, uh, sometimes we emphasize how to use uh, tools and how to develop uh, understandings of tools. But how do, how do we understand, for example, fake news? What is fake news? Why is it fake news? From who is it fake news? Um, and I, I think that engagement is really the key. And so this is why on the one hand, <laughs> Nobody really likes hate speech, but on the other hand, it's important to engage. And some of the research in social media indicates that people intersect within their network, but not outside. So we have a lot of linkages with people who agree with us. And often when there are disagreements, um, so how do we engage with these people? But I'm, I'm very surprised in a way, uh, for example, even in Canada, there are so many hate groups and so many movements, even in relation to the pandemic, so many conspiracies but often these conspiracies lead to other uh, types of thinking that are connected sometimes to xenophobia. Uh, so I think this is, this is where I would situate my thinking is not to look for a Ku Klux Klan with a white hood, but other types of thinking where people don't want to see intercultural diversity. And how do we address that? So I think the political system in a way it's, uh, we have to really think about so, uh, civil society and social movements as well. Oh, yes. So you think that you mentioned many different groups, vulnerable groups, vulnerable to hate speech, and uh, it's uh, a challenge how to prioritize them in, in the mill work and how to reach out to them, how to make an impact. Uh, now we have been talking about uh, the conditions and uh, the policies. Let's get to the concrete question of pedagogies, both in formal and informal educational settings. Um, do you have any good examples? Because now we have really have have to focus for the positive examples, <laughs> as as Milena stressed uh, at the beginning. Any any examples of good um, or best practices that have really made an impact in your country, combating hate speech? Please feel free to say your yeah. favorite word. Mm, yeah, from uh, from Nigeria. Yes, we have uh, <clears throat> some good examples. But I would say that you should not major on best practices. You should talk about continuous best practices. Because best practices put a kind of slab on what you can achieve. So in Nigeria, for instance, uh, some of us, I think we came together, academics and academics, we come out with a comic book. 
a comic book that teach young ones because we see that children are the most vulnerable. Because once their mind has been shaped, you know, they go with that mentality all the way up. So what to come up with is comic books. And those comic books, I think we give it to UNESCO, can be shared around the whole world, about illustrative diagrams and on intercultural you know, alignment, how you can understand people's culture, how you can relate with them, how you can frame your language so you don't create tensions and come to society at this one. Second, we came up also with a new game about critical thinking. You know, it's a game where you play the game and when you get to a point where you are going to fake news or a speech, that game will, you know, will draw you back. So that one also is about think about talking about you should understand people who are behind the information you are consuming. Just like Paul Kass said, there are so many uh, people around the world who are championing a speech, but you need to understand as an individual where are people coming from, what is the ideology behind what they are saying. Once you understand that, you'll be able to engage with them. Now, thirdly, what also we are doing is we have new clubs, like somebody said on this club, we go around the old schools, and these schools also, uh, we teach them what literacy, how to understand books, how to read, how to match people, how to understand a speech. Then the last one, is what UNESCO, UNESCO said. Say, since war begins in the heart of men, is in the heart of men, we will build the bastions of peace. So what we have been doing, I believe that project is main, main curriculum. Main curriculum in, in schools, especially in the university system. And we are pushing it that it should either be a standalone course or it should be part of the courses where people are taught and how to how to how to how to uh, you know how to relate with people and how to think critically how to respond to you know intercultural dialogue between them and these are the issues so many more, so, so many more uh, but uh, because of time let me just allow that to talk thank you so much <laughs> thank you good that you are highlighting the importance of, of the uh, mill curriculum uh, any other best uh, practices or examples Mila? i might add uh, up um, uh, very quickly this is the most recent is the manual for parents uh, that was developed in a joint action of uh, civil society and the ministry of culture and information and i think that's something really useful which incorporates uh, the whole uh, chapter let's say about hatred speech but very important actions are done by several of our museums museum of yugoslavia and museum of contemporary arts that enables a view for example it was a hundred year of the creation of kingdom of yugoslavia and they enabled to be seen for the first time ever in belgrade in serbia position of montenegrian side how from their side looked this let's say joint venture and so on. I think this work, Museum of Contemporary Arts, again, is representing authors from uh, now across the borders. And this is, uh, I, I wouldn't say just building bridges, but it makes people more susceptible susceptible to understand the other, as well as it was done by the convention about the language, signed already at the beginning by 300 scholars, now by thousands and thousands of people about, and that's against our politicians or all sides, about a common language with four names, because that's contested by our politicians that that's the common language, but we do not translate each other. And finally, Buka, which is internet portal. Now I have to say something very positive about internet portals. Uh, Buka is from Banja Luka, and they created a video clip against hatred speech called hate Slovenia because it sounds like hey Slovenia our former anthem but now it's hate Slovenia Slavs and uh, it really uh, puts in front the the usage of the language how we address each other in a pejorative way Serbs Bosnians and Croats and this uh, was seen by in two days by five million people. Oh, uh, the the uses of language as a more inclusive tool. That's a very very good point. Um, 
to make. And as an academic, I'd like to add that in media theory, there has been uh, said to be an emotional or affective turn occurring. And I think we academics also have a role here to play. Scholars have be become more interested in the role of emotions and affects that direct communication and the use of language, as you say. So to make create a common and, and more inclusive uh, language and an understanding of it um, uh, is, port is important and this has to be made in collaboration with uh, different stakeholders, of course. But dear panelists, uh, dear audience, uh, it, would be, it would be nice to continue this discussion, uh, but it's time to, to uh, wrap up because our time is up. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, our dear panelists, uh, for sharing your valuable insights today. Uh, thank you all who asked questions and followed the discussion. Let's celebrate the world press freedom in the upcoming days and continue to develop mill approaches that can make a difference. Thank you and have a nice day. The way we create and consume information has changed.